If you were a hairstylist, would you be the jerk for refusing to cut a client's long hair? We'll get into that in a bit, but first, am I the jerk for telling my brother it was a dumb decision to invite his new girlfriend over for our nephew's birthday, and I understand why our brother-in-law uninvited him? My 20-year-old male, brother Ron, 27-year-old male, met his late girlfriend Linda when they were 16, and they started dating shortly after. To say the family adored her would be an understatement. Linda was beautiful, smart, and had an amazing sense of humor. She's been part of the family for so long that most of us don't remember a time without her. Most of our best memories have her in them. Linda was very close to my nephew Drew, 6-year-old male. Drew is disabled and autistic, so he has a hard time connecting to other people. I don't know how to describe the relationship between Drew and Linda. They just sort of clicked. From the moment he was born, she was his best friend and would often watch over him. Sadly, Linda passed away at the end of January after she was hit by a drunk driver. The entire family was devastated and were still mourning her. Drew took it especially hard since he doesn't really grasp what death means yet. He constantly asks where Linda is and when she'll be coming back, sometimes going as far as having full-blown meltdowns because he misses her so much. He's currently attending therapy to learn how to process his grief, but it's a slow progress. Drew's birthday is in two weeks, and my sister and brother-in-law sent out invitations to everyone in the family asking who can come. Birthdays are a big deal in our family, and are usually an over-the-top event with catering, so it's necessary to confirm the number of guests. Apparently Ron wrote that he'll come with Gia, a new girlfriend he's hoping to introduce to the family. Most of the family is pissed at him for moving on so quickly. I personally think it's none of my business and I'm not going to tell him what to do or how to live his life. However, bringing a new partner over to his nephew's birthday when he knows how said nephew is so attached to his former girlfriend and is still mourning her is idiotic at best and cruel at worst. Brother-in-law told Ron that if he's planning on bringing that girl over for Drew's birthday, he shouldn't bother coming at all. Ron called to complain and I told him the same thing, he shouldn't bring her over. Ron called me a jerk and a bad brother. He said that he's finally happy again after Linda's death. And why is it so hard for us to accept that he moved on and support his relationship? I told him I'm happy to hear he's doing well, and I'm sure the family would someday love to meet that girl that makes him so happy. But I'm standing by my opinion that inviting her now was a dumb decision on his part, and he chose the worst possible time and place to introduce someone new to the family. I don't think OP's necessarily in the wrong here. I think they have every right to move on and see somebody new if that's what they want, but I agree that it's just not the right time or place to do it. More power to them and especially for wanting to introduce them to the family, but at this kid's birthday where it'll be especially traumatic potentially for them, not the right venue. I would assume most people would agree, right? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy getting to decide whether or not all of these people are jerks, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, am I the jerk for not giving my sister-in-law and her family a luxury vacation? I travel a lot for work, so I have so many hotel and airline points, it is crazy. This summer, I'm taking my family to Disney World. We're going to stay at one of the resorts on the property. My sister-in-law and her family had a hard time during the pandemic, so I decided to do something nice and invite them along. My treat. I said I would pay for their flights, hotel, and park tickets. Everyone was excited until she started talking to my wife. Now she's upset that we're staying at one of the resorts and they have to stay in Disney Springs. Apparently I'm being cheap by using points for their hotel instead of just paying for them to stay at the same resort as us. My wife told her sister and brother-in-law to shut the freak up and accept the gift, but they didn't. They told my in-laws that I was making their kid jealous by not letting them enjoy the same stuff as us. To be clear, the hotel I booked for them is very nice, it's just not the Grand Floridian. So I finally talked to them and gave them the choice of accepting my gift or not coming, since I could still cancel their reservations. They started yelling at me for being a jerk and taking something away from their children. I had talked to them like adults, but when they started screaming, their kids heard them and found out that they might not be going. Now, their kids are pissed at their parents for possibly screwing up their vacation, and I'm the bigger jerk for making them look bad in front of their kids. Am I the jerk? 100% not the jerk. I don't understand how they can even begin to complain when it's a free vacation that you're getting for them. 
I mean, at some point, when do you just finally say, you know what, we've had enough, we're canceling it regardless? Our next story is, am I the jerk for refusing to pitch in money toward my sister-in-law's IVF treatments and telling her and my brother that their future children are not my responsibility? My brother Reed and sister-in-law Nora have always wanted children. However, they're unable to conceive naturally. Nora had multiple ovarian cysts and eventually needed to have both their ovaries removed as a teenager. Reed and Nora are in their early 30s and are very urgent about needing to try sooner than never because they say they're approaching an age where IVS success rates start to decline. Because of Nora's past medical issues, I'm told that she'll need extra care and her round of treatments will be especially expensive, a little over $27,000. Reed and Nora already have $9,000 set aside in savings for IVF treatments. They've raised $1,000 from friends. The rest of the family is pitching in smaller amounts as well. My mother's giving $2,000, Nora's sister Lauren is giving $1,000, and her parents are giving $4,000, which leaves about $10,000 left. Their insurance will not help cover it because they don't consider it a medically necessary procedure. Reed and Nora have also had difficulty qualifying for an IVF loan as they have poor credit. Reed and Nora are asking me to help because, according to a loan advisor, I am allowed to take out the loan on Reed and Nora's behalf. $10,000 is a huge ask for me. And the fact that Reed and Nora have poor credit shows that they already don't have a good track record of paying back loans. When I questioned why they didn't ask Lauren, they claimed they couldn't because she isn't single and childless like I am. They see it as me not having any dependents. My mother and parents-in-law don't have a lot of savings and their earlier mentioned donations were already a huge gift for them. It takes a long time to correct a bad credit score, and it makes things much more difficult. And harsh as it is to say, I don't want to take out thousands of dollars in a loan for a procedure that has a good chance of not even working. So I told Reed and Nora no, and that their future children are not my responsibility. I also wanted to put my foot down now, because next it's going to be private school tuition, or a college fund, and that shouldn't be my responsibility just because I'm currently single and childless. Nora was obviously disappointed, but told me she respected my choice. Reed was angry. He told me that he would remember this for when I'm ever in a time of need so that I'll know how it feels to have family turn their back on me. The rest of the family members have essentially told me, we're not mad at you, just disappointed because Nora worried for years that she would never be able to have children or be a mother. They said Reed and Nora would be wonderful parents and isn't right that they can't conceive naturally, which I do agree with. However, I still stand by Nora and Reed's future children not being my responsibility. I don't think it's fair that I should delay or give up the possibility of starting my own family in order to finance Reed and Nora's. Am I the jerk? Definitely not the jerk. $10,000 is just honestly way too much to expect anybody to give you. And if they can't find a way to scrap out a $10,000 loan, are they in the greatest situation to pay for a kid either? This next story is, am I the jerk for not putting my sister's wedding expenses on my credit card and humiliating her? I, 27-year-old female, was the only person in my family to go to college and get out of poverty. My family is from a small town and we struggled a lot growing up. I got out but it's hard because I make a good salary now and my family expects me to share it. I still have student loans and bills to pay but they seem to think I'm rolling in money. I also bought an apartment in 2019 and when my parents found out, they called me selfish and wanted me to pay for their expenses. I've loaned money to my parents, about $800 and they forgot they borrowed money and claimed I forgot that I gave it as a gift and said they didn't need to repay. My sister and I used to have a good relationship, but once I left for college and did better, our relationship got more strained. She got married and I came back a few days before the wedding to help her set everything up. We went to the grocery store and she bought $1,700 worth of groceries as we were cooking it for the wedding. Her card was denied and she tried a few, but they were all denied. We stepped aside and she called the credit card company to find out she nearly maxed out her cards. She started to panic and checked her accounts and found she had $200 left in checking. I told her to check savings and she snapped back that she didn't have any. 
and our mom checked her card and still had $600, so she said she would cover $600 and volunteered me for the other $1,100. I told them I didn't have the money. I did, but I don't think my sister would have the money to pay me back. My sister demanded to see proof that I'd maxed out my credit cards and I didn't have any money in my checking, and I told her I don't have to give her proof, I just don't have the money. She started crying and yelling at me that I was looking down on her for being broke, and she knew I have the money, I'm just being stingy. My mom started on me too, telling me that people are staring and people are going to gossip about this, and I was humiliating my sister for making it seem like she couldn't even afford her own wedding. I had enough and walked out and told them I'd had it with them expecting me to pay for everything. I walked back to my parents' house, and my sister sent me a text saying I was no longer welcome to the wedding. I drove home without another word, and I'm wondering if I should have just put the groceries on my card to keep the peace. Absolutely not. OP should not have felt compelled to spend $1,100 on a whim like that. I'm sure some would even wager that this was an intentional thing to try to get you to cough up some money. Our next story is, am I the jerk for refusing to remove the hunting mounts when my sister-in-law is staying at the cabin? My family has a hunting cabin that's been passed down for generations. I'm an only child, so it went to me when my father died. Now, I don't really hunt, always found it boring, but going up to the cabin to fish or just swim with the kids has always been fun. I fix the place up and it's a great place to get away for the weekend. Now, my sister-in-law fell on hard times. We were going to have her stay at the house, but her drive to work would be awful. So we decided to have her stay at the cabin since her drive would be a lot better and more room for everyone. I went up with her this week and showed the cabin before she moves in next week. The cabin is old and over the years family members have gotten mounts or what they hunted preserved. There are a lot of furs, rugs and head mounts. She told me she can move in and needed them to go. I was taken aback since we're doing her a huge favor. I told her all the stuff is staying. She was mad but I thought that was it. I get home and my wife goes off on me for caring more about the family mounts than her sister being comfortable. She's not talking to me and I just feel like we're doing a huge favor for sister-in-law and that she can't suck it up then she doesn't get a free place to live. Well, considering the family history, it wouldn't be fair just to OP, but a number of people if you took all those down and where are you going to put those in the meantime? I agree, this is a free place to live, you can't look a gift horse in the mouth. Our next story is, am I the jerk for talking about stuff happening at my dad's house with my mom? I, 17, have a 4 year old half brother. My dad is getting him evaluated for autism because his pediatrician told him to. I asked my dad why the pediatrician thinks my brother is, and my dad didn't really want to talk about it with me. But he ended up saying it was because my brother started talking later than normal. The thing is, my mom always tells the story about how I didn't start talking like a normal kid, that I didn't say a word until I was almost five, and then said a full sentence. I asked if that was similar, but my dad says he doesn't remember that and my mom probably made it up. My dad didn't want to talk anymore, but I felt weird about the conversation. I looked up more stuff about autism and ended up asking my mom if she remembered me doing those things. She asked why I wanted to know, so I told her. She ended up calling my dad and asking him about the situation. My dad and his wife are pretty upset that I did that because they say my half-brother's medical situation is none of my mom's business and I shouldn't be gossiping about it with her. I wasn't trying to gossip, I just had more questions and my dad wasn't interested in answering and claimed not to remember. My mom always says I can talk to her about anything. I know my youngest brother isn't her son but who can I talk to if I can't talk to my mom? Am I the jerk? I don't think OP's the jerk but I do think the mom shouldn't have just like gone around bringing it up. OP's mom should have had tact and known that it's not really their place to comment on that, especially when their own kid is telling them that their father wasn't opening up about it. Anybody in that situation who thinks maybe I am actually affected by this too would want to find out. Maybe if anything the father is the jerk for being so shielded about it. This next story is, am I the jerk for wanting my wife to stay up during a road trip and talk to me? I'm writing this right now at the hotel where I'm at because I'm genuinely at a loss of words. I don't think I'm in the wrong but at the same time, she looks really pissed at me. My wife, me and our 2 year old are going on our first family road trip to California. 
we rotate driving in shifts, but the problem is that when I was driving, my shift fell during the night, and so I was feeling really lonely and bored as I was driving. I'm not someone who can be left to his own thoughts very well, and I need people around me. I thrive on energy and excitement. My wife is a bit of the opposite. She's generally fine with being left alone and can sit quietly for hours and hours upon end. The problem is that around 11 p.m., I was driving and my wife and our son were in the back seat. I was feeling isolated, so I shook her awake, but then our son woke up. And well, you can probably guess what happens next. Once he quieted down, my wife began to quietly blow up at me about how much of a jerk I was being. I told her that it wasn't fair for her to just sleep like that and it made me feel like a driver. She then said that she doesn't force me to stay awake or engage with her, but I told her that's a cheap blow because we're not the same people. And I kept my mouth shut while she was driving because I know she doesn't like distractions, even though it bothered me terribly. So the least she could do is to stop being selfish and help keep me sane. Despite my perfectly logical answer, she apparently got emotional and then started whisper screaming some crap about how raising one toddler was hard enough and that she didn't know there was another one in the car who needed his whims catered to at every moment. And at that point, since she got rude, I decided to disengage. Now our whole trip is falling apart and she's making me out to be the bad guy. All I know is, is sleep is one of the most important things a person can have in their lives. If this is at night during a road trip where she's probably been driving for quite a while and taking care of the toddler probably for the most part, she probably needs that sleep and it's kind of selfish to just expect her to stay up to keep you slightly more engaged during the night shift. Likewise, if you drove through the night and you're going to start sleeping through some of the day while she's driving, she would be the jerk for trying to keep you up. If driving in silence is that much of an issue, then maybe you shouldn't have gone on a road trip. Our next story is, am I the jerk for not making peace after leaving my stepmother out of wedding dress shopping and not abiding by my dad's rules? My fiancé, 21-year-old male, proposed to me, 22-year-old female, last August. My mom decided to host an engagement party and invite her side of the family. Her and dad are divorced. Later, dad and stepmom, A, asked to speak with my fiancé and I, a was upset about being left out of the celebration and not being treated equal to mom. I apologized, reminded her I love her like a mother, and explained to her that mom arranged the party and we didn't mean to hurt any feelings. A said if there's any chance of that happening again, to please not involve her in the first place. I asked her if she was sure. She said she was. After this, I kept A involved in the things I wanted her to be a part of. I can't involve mom and A in the same things at the same time. The venue would be A's thing. This went well, we picked one mostly together. In October, A asked when we should start dress shopping. I told her I already had a dress I picked out. I went with my maid of honor before she left to study abroad, my mom and sister a month earlier. I didn't invite A because she asked me not to tell her about things I wasn't involving her in and I would have to pick between A and my mom so I picked my mom. A sent me a message saying she couldn't be involved in the wedding anymore because it was too hurtful. I apologized. I visited again in January and didn't speak to A. Dad gave me all my childhood Christmas ornaments. I apparently wasn't invited back. A week later, my dad asked me to apologize to A for not inviting her to go dress shopping. I told him I've been the one making peace and apologizing since I was a child. It's a pattern for A to blow things out of proportion and not take accountability for it. This is the first time that I've decided not to be the peacemaker and left it to dad and A to fix things. After I made it clear I wasn't going to apologize, dad said, I don't even want to go to your wedding because of this. Ouch. A month later, dad asked us to meet and talk. I insisted we needed a counselor present so my side would be acknowledged. Before meeting, he set eight rules I had to follow for him to be in the ceremony. One, I can't treat A the way I've been treating her. Two, A will be at the wedding to support dad. Three, it'll only be the two of us walking down the aisle. Four, mom and stepdad will not be up in the ceremony at the same time as dad. Five, I must see dad away from mom. 6. Dad will not include mom in anything. If asked, who gives away this bride, he'll respond, A and I do. 
7. If I do not treat A with respect, Dad and A will leave as soon as the ceremony is over. 8. If I do not abide by these expectations, Dad will walk out during the ceremony. I told him I won't be following his rules for my wedding, so I understand if he chooses not to be a part of the ceremony. My aunt and cousin told me later that at Christmas, Dad and A told everyone that I was cheating on my fiancé before he proposed. The statement is completely fictional. Yesterday I asked Dad for his RSVP. He said he booked a vacation instead to celebrate Father's Day. Sadly, as much as it pains me to say, you don't need them at your wedding, they're trying to make it all about them. You and everybody else that wants to actually celebrate your wedding would be better off without them there. I hope they feel good about their Father's Day vacation. This next story is, am I the jerk how I phrased my reply to my parents' request for financial assistance for my sister? My parents had me very young, like in high school. They had an on-again, off-again relationship from my childhood with my maternal grandparents actually doing most of the parenting until I was 12 and they got married and got their crap together. They had my sister two years after that. I was always a second thought with them. Our vacations were suited to an infant. Our home was full of stuff for a little kid, not a teen. Whatever. I got out of school and my grandpa helped me get an apprenticeship as a welder. I enjoy the work and the money is great. I have my own rig now and just bought a house. My sister's into ballet and she's really good. She has an opportunity to go to a summer program, but it will cost a lot of money. My parents cannot afford it at all. They asked me to help and I said no. They said that I should help her out because she looks up to me. I said no. They said I make more money than I need and they'll have to go into debt for her to go on this program. I offered to give them back all the money they spent on my extracurricular activities as my contribution. They said I was being a jerk because when I was young they couldn't afford to pay for the stuff I was interested in. I pointed out that they're old and they still can't afford crap. My grandparents said I was too harsh for how I phrased it but they know that my parents did heck all for me growing up. Am I the jerk? Now if you want to give your sister anything, that's great but you're not obligated to and no amount of shaming you for past incidents can just automatically make you have to give anything to anybody. Our next story is, am I the jerk for getting annoyed at my wife for having no nappies in the nappy bag? So I, male 35, took the baby, female 2, out the other day whilst my wife, female 35, was at work. I'm prepared for several hours out of the house, snack, juice, books, don't mess with duck, which I highly recommend, etc. I grab the nappy bag, throw it in the pram, and leave. We go to the pub for a spot of lunch. We read a story, I drink some of my pint, and then the baby poos. No problem. I threw the nappy bag into the pram. I go through said bag, and there are no nappies. It's 21 degrees Celsius outside, she's in a dress, and I've promised the park. I am panicking. There are trousers in the bag? Do I just bang them on and style it out? Do we sack off the park and go home? Do I just deal with that meltdown? Luckily the pub have nappies in the changing room and I bang her in some tight fitting neonatal nappies and we head for the park. When I get home, my wife gets annoyed at me for not checking the bag before leaving. My standpoint, if you use the last nappy, you should replenish the bag. And the nappy bag is a grab bag. She thinks I'm the jerk for not checking. I think she's the jerk for not replenishing the nappy supply in the bag when she uses the last one. So Reddit, am I the jerk? So while I do agree that she should have replaced the bag if there was none left, OP's still the one with egg on their face for not just double checking real quick. To me this is honestly though the equivalent of like using the last bit of toilet paper and you just leave the cardboard roll on the hanger. If you use the last bit, replace it. This next story is, am I the jerk for having my niece's dress photoshopped because she wore white to my wedding? So I, 30 year old female, got married. Yay! Honestly, it was my dream wedding. Everything went off without a hitch. Except for one small thing, my niece's 16 dress. It was a white lacy knee length dress. She even wore lace elbow length gloves. Honestly, it looked just like a wedding dress. I didn't say anything to her or her parents, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, in the moment and I tried my best to ignore it, but when I got the first drafts back from our photographer, 
I couldn't stand when I saw her in white dress standing next to me. My husband saw how upset I was and suggested that we pay extra to get my niece's dress photoshopped to a light blue. We thought it through and since we had some budget left, we went for it. Well, last week we got the final photos back and they looked great. I could hardly even tell that my niece was originally wearing white and she still looked really nice. I posted some photos on social media and my sister-in-law messaged me and was angry that I photoshopped my niece without checking with her, my sister-in-law first. She accused me of thinking my niece was ugly and of body shaming her. To be clear, I did not have her body photoshopped, only the color of her dress and gloves. I don't think I'm in the wrong, but this situation has been stressing me out, so am I the jerk? I mean, obviously they shouldn't have wore the white dress to begin with. I don't think photoshopping just the dress to be a different color is too big of an affront on a person's character or image, so I can't blame OP. This next story is, am I the jerk for refusing to cut a client's extremely long hair? I'm a hairstylist. I had mom book her daughter in for a trim and color with me. I'm not their usual stylist. The stylist they usually go to is on holiday, and I was recommended to them by a friend. When the mom booked the trim and color in, she specified that her daughter had long hair and asked if that was okay for me to handle. The receptionist said yes because I have a lot of clients with waist length hair. Waist length is usually the longest hair I'll cut. I've never had a client with hair longer than this. Due to issues with my knee, I can't kneel down for long. I'm awaiting surgery. When they turned up for the appointment, the daughter had her hair up in a bun so I couldn't see the full length of her hair. The mom thanked me for being able to fit her daughter in. She said that when their usual stylist isn't available, it can be difficult to get her daughter an appointment due to her hair length. When the daughter sat in my chair, I asked her to take her hair down so that I could brush through it before we started her ombre color. When she took her hair down, I noticed it was much longer than I expected. I asked her how long the hair was, and she said it was a knee length. She brushed her hair back so that it was going all down the back of the chair and it was well past the length I was comfortable cutting at. I would have had to have kneeled down to color and cut her hair. I waved the mum over as I told the daughter to take off the gown. I apologized to the mum and told her that I would not be able to cut her daughter's hair due to its length. I explained that it was too long for me to cut as I couldn't kneel down to cut her hair. Understandably, the mum was upset that I was refusing to cut her daughter's hair. She demanded the booking fee back. I informed her that the 50 British pound booking fee was non-refundable and she would have been told this at time of booking. She then demanded to speak to the manager of the salon. I told her I would get her the owner. The owner of the salon did refund her the money. She told me that I shouldn't have taken the booking if I couldn't cut hair that long. I told her that the length had never been specified to me. The receptionist was just told long and that long hair in our area is usually no longer than waist length. She knows I can't kneel without being in pain. The mom has since been writing on the Facebook page of the salon complaining that I refuse to cut her daughter's hair because we can't actually cut long hair. I feel bad that the mom is upset about this, but at the same time, it was never specified how long her daughter's hair actually was. Am I the jerk for refusing to cut extremely long hair? I feel like this one's pretty obvious. OP has a disability and they couldn't do it. It's not fair for OP to put up with lots of pain just because, honestly, the receptionist failed their job. That said, I definitely think OP's reaction saying the booking fee was non-refundable was a bit of a jerk move. I'm guessing that's just the salon policy and there's no like room to negotiate there. But man, I would be pissed too honestly if I was the mom. Our next story is, am I the jerk for not letting my son see his bio dad? My wife and I adopted our son Adam, 13, right after he was born. My sister had drug issues and his bio dad signed away all custody. My sister is MIA to the family most part and Adam knows of her. His bio dad was imprisoned about 10 years ago and his whole family is messed up. Bio just recently released from prison and his caseworker wants him to meet our son and have a better connection with him. He signed away custody and I said no. My wife agrees. Our son is sensitive and does well in school and will be attending a private science and STEM focused high school. He's top of his class, enjoys music and video games and wants to be an engineer or composer 
I do not want some man fresh out of prison to try and create a selfish bond with my son. Bio's caseworker insists he's clean and wants to be involved in Adam's life. I said if he genuinely cared about my son, he'd leave well enough alone until my son was an adult. I don't think being released from prison early is enough to merit him a relationship with Adam, and I'll spend all of my money on lawyers to make sure it doesn't happen. The caseworker said I was a jerk for not giving a man a second chance at happiness, but I'm not disrupting my son's life over this. Now, I don't know what they ended up in prison for, but considering they were prisoned for 10 years, it was probably something pretty darn serious, and I can understand, when your kid is literally thriving, you don't want that to potentially screw everything up. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another crazy Am I the Jerk here story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.